Hey guys, this is Allison from Alley Cat Creations. How are you? Happy 4th of July, United States. Almost 4th, not quite yet. Um, so I was really, 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 really sick. I had food poisoning the last four days. I'm still not 100%. Um, I attempted Oracle readings, they were successful. Um, come to find out my air conditioning also is looking like it took a bomb. Love that. Um, thankfully it's not hot out. So I'm going to attempt One of my favorites, um, but this time around, I'm going to read from the book as much as possible. Um, hard, I was doing notes on it and I just make it sound worse than it, it is in its definition that it's already plainly written out. So I'm just gonna read it, uh, the next two, the all in all and the planes of correspondence. Um, I think it's very important that we get these principles understood, um, especially with what's been happening in our paradigm and what's been going on now. Um, so before I begin, Please hit that like button. Please subscribe. Please share this like crazy. Um, it helps circulate, you know, especially people who are on the spiritual side. People are brought to pages because they need to be awakened by certain people, have a message, certain things are said. Whatever it is, more people are waking up and more people need to see. Also, if you have it within you to help me out and support my work, if I connected a dot, if you gotten anything out of my work, a book to read, an epiphany, a light bulb, a flash, a connection, it's gonna help me get to a better situation. Cause um, right now I'm in a very big issued hole and I can use all the help that I can get. Um, and that also includes jobs. I'm not here to like swindle people or scam people out of money. That's not me. Um, I can't pay my bills. I'm very lucky I have the internet and the lights on right now. Um, I am attempting to clean out my house and sell it. It's gonna take a while, it's just me. And I have 37 years worth of stuff. And even though I cleaned everything a lot out when my parents died, I still have a whole lot to do. Um, so again, and that doesn't help that I was really out of it for the last four days, very, very sick. I'm still not there a hundred percent yet, but I, I'm like, all right, now I'm still, I'm resting. I'm gonna do, a, I'm gonna do a reading. We're gonna try this. So in the Kabbalion, the all in all, while quote, while all is in the all, it is equally true that the all is in all. To him who truly understands this truth hath come great knowledge, and quote the Kabbalion. How often have the majority of people heard repeated the statement that their deity, again, call it by whatever name you give your deity,
was all in all. And how little have they suspected the inner occult truth concealed by these carelessly uttered words. The commonly used expression is a survival of the ancient hermetic maxim quoted above. As the Kabbalion says, quote, to him who truly understands this truth hath come great knowledge, end quote. And this being so, let us seek this truth, the understanding of which means so much. In this statement of truth, this hermetic maxim is concealed one of the greatest philosophical, scientific, and religious truths. And I agree with that. When we are thinking about the deity and the all, what encompasses the all, what is the all? It's everything in existence, material and non-physical. Everything. Everything. We have given you the hermetic teaching regarding mental nature and the universe, the truth that the universe is mental, held in the mind of the all. And everyone, we all hold it. We all hold pieces of that all. All of us, every one of us, we hold it. As the Kabbalion says in the passage quoted above, all is in the all. But note also that co-related statement that, quote, it is equally true that the all is in the all. Now do you see why I have to read out of the book? End quote. This apparently contradictory statement is reconcilable under the law of paradox. It is, moreover, an exact hermetic statement of the relations existing between the all and its mental universe. We have seen how, quote, all is in the all. Now let us examine the other aspect. This is one of the harder ones to pluck and pick. because they, they just give really good analogies. I'm explaining it. The hermetic teachings are to the effect that the all is eminent in remaining within, inherent, abiding within its universe and in every part, particle, unit, or combination within the universe. This statement is usually illustrated by the teachers by a reference to the principle of correspondence. The teacher instructs the student from, to form a mental image of something, a person, an idea, something having a mental form. The favorite example being that of an author or a dramatist forming an idea of his characters or a painter or sculptor forming an image of an ideal that he wishes to express by his art. In each case, the student will find that while the image has its existence and being solely within his own mind, yet he, the student, author, dramatist, painter, or sculptor, is in a sense eminent in remaining within or abiding within the mental image also. In other words, the entire virtue, life, spirit, and reality and mental image is derived from the imminent mind of the thinker. See, I'm an artist and I get downloads or I get it uh, something to make in my mind with the available amount of supplies that I have at my disposal. And I construct 
what I want to make or build or paint in my mind, and then I transfer it to the material world. So let's say some of you are crafty people and you want to make a bench and you want to board burn on the bench or make it a certain way. You're creating an image in your mind of how you want that bench to turn out. And then you get the supplies and the materials and then you shape and form that wood or whatever you're constructing it out of into a bench. Consider this for a moment until the idea is grasped. To take a modern example, let us say that Othello, Agio, Hamlet, Lear, Richard III existed merely in the mind of Shakespeare at the time of their conception or creation. And yet Shakespeare also existed within each of these characters, giving them their vitality, spirit in action. Who's is the spirit of the characters who we know as Macabre, Oliver Twist, Uriah Eat. Is it Dickens? Or have each of these characters a personal spirit independent of their creator? Think about that. Are they characteristics of Dickens? Or Shakespeare. We all have sides to ourselves that we don't express in public or to people. We have imaginary figmentations of ourselves that we would like to play out in reality, but we don't do it for whatever the reason. You know, it could be naughty. It could be, you know, a fantastical um, sci-fi version of you that, you know, people will make fun of, you think, if you were to go and try to play that character role out. But if you wrote it down and made a character out of it, but that still might be an aspect of you. Have the Venus of Medici, the Sistine Madonna, the Apollo Belvedere, spirits and reality of their own, or do they represent the spiritual and mental power of their creators? The law of paradox explains that both propositions are true. Viewed from the proper viewpoints, Macabre is both Macabre and yet Dickens. And again, while Macabre may be said to be Dickens, yet Dickens is not identical with Macabre. Man, like Macabre, may exclaim, quote, the spirit of my creator is inherent within me, and yet I am not he, end quote. How different this form, how different this from the shocking half-truth so vicariously announced by certain of the half-wise who fill the air with their rancorous cries of quote, I am God, end quote. Imagine poor Macabre or the sneaky Uriah Heap crying, I am Dickens, or some of the lowly clods in one of Shakespeare's plays. Grandiloquently, that's not projecting out of my mouth right now, FYI, announcing that I am Shakespeare, the all, is in the earthworm, and yet the earthworm is far from being the all. And still the wonder remains that through the earthworm exists merely as a lowly thing, created and having its being solely within the mind of the all, yet the all is eminent in the earthworm, and in the particles that go to make up the earthworm. Can there be any greater mystery than this of all in the all? And the all in the all? I know it's confusing. The student will, of course, realize that the illustrations given above are necessarily imperfect and inadequate, for they represent the creation of mental images in finite minds. While the universe is a creation of infinite mind, 
and the difference between the two poles separates them. And yet it is merely a matter of degree. This, this same principle is in operation. The principle of correspondence manifests in each as above, so below, as below, so above. And in the degree that man realizes the existence of the indwelling spirit imminent within his being, so will he rise in the spiritual scale of life. This is what spiritual development means. The recognition, realization, and manifestation of the spirit within us. And that's what we all need to work on right now. It contains the truth of true religion. There are going to be a huge paradigm shift happening within the next few months. A lot of people are going to um, be more in aware and cognizant of what really religion is. And it's not gonna be pretty um, for everything that I've researched and I've listened to others do their research. Um, these principles are very important to understand. And the fact of the matter is it brings you closer to understanding that you are a fractalization of creator, and that you're a specimen of the all. There are many planes of being, many subplanes of life, many degrees of existence in the universe. And I speak about that when I speak about the law of one that we are vibrating. Remember the principle of, of rhythm and, and polarity? We're vibrating and we're not always in, in, in one center of space. We're always bouncing back and forth. We're always vibrating. There's always motion and movement. And there's definitely sub octaves and octaves and sub subs of vibration and frequency that we all inhabit at any one given time in the space time continuum. And all depend upon the advancement of beings in the scale of which scale the lowest point is the grossest matter, the highest being separated only by the thinnest division from the spirit of the all and upward and onward along this scale of life. Everything is moving. All are on the path whose end is the all. Because at the end of moving up in densities, whatever high as de highest density you can get to, you're gonna go back and recycle back into the all or creator, whatever you wanna call it. All progress is a returning home. All is upward and onward in spite of all seemingly contradictory appearances. Such is the message of the illumined. So you have to like really deduce a bunch of stuff. You are in the all. You are participating in the mental universe. You are a participant in the all. You are a fractal of the all, the big all. You're a fractal of it, living out your existence. And as you vibrate higher, as you go up in density, as you vibrate higher and you're in your lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and your scales is tipping more towards whatever scale it's going to tip towards you're eventually going to return home back to the absolute all and go back into the one 
although we are all one inhabited the same. Because we all possess a fractal of the all. The hermetic teachings concerning the process of the mental creation of the universe are that at the beginning of the creative cycle, the big all in its, res in, in its aspect of being projects its will toward its aspect of becoming and the process of creating creation beings. It is taught that the process consists of lowering of vibration until a very low degree of vibratory energy is reached, at which point the grossest possible form of matter is manifested. Sadly, that's why we're on three. It's not high. It's very, very dense. This process is called the stage of involution in which the all becomes involved or wrapped up in its creation. This process is believed by the hermeticists to have a correspondence to the mental process of an artistic writer or inventor who becomes so wrapped up in his mental creation as to almost forget his own existence and who for the time being almost lives in his creation. If instead of wrapped, we use the word wrapped or apt, perhaps we will give a better idea of what is meant. This involuntary stage of creation is sometimes called the outpouring of the divine energy, just as the evolutionary state is called the indrawing. The extreme pole of the creative process is considered to be the furthest removed from the all, which the beginning of the evolutionary stage is regarded as the beginning of the return swing of the pendulum of rhythm, a coming home idea being held in all of the hermetic teachings. I know. But again, think about what I went over with the rhythm and, and the polarity and the swinging. Think about it. The teachings are that during the outpouring, the vibrations become lower and lower until finally the urge ceases and the return swing begins. But there is this difference that while in outpouring, the creative forces manifest compactly and as whole, yet from the beginning of evolutionary or in drawing stage, there is manifested the law of individualization that is the tendency to separate into units of force. So that finally, that which left the all as unindividualized energy returns to its source as countless highly developed units of life, having risen higher and higher in the scale of means of physical, mental, and spiritual evolution. And that's the journey we're all gonna be taking very shortly. Yeah, I don't know what to do with my hair, F FYI. It's ridiculously long. Like, but I'm not cutting it. The ancient hermeticists used the word meditation in describing the process of mental creation of the universe in the mind of the all. The word contemplation also being frequently employed, but the idea intended seems to be that of the employment of the divine attention. Attention is a word derived from the Latin root, meaning to reach out, to stretch out. And so the act of attention is really a mental reaching out, extension of mental energy, so that the underlying idea is readily understood when we examine into the real meaning of attention. 
the hermetic teachings regarding the process of evolution are that the all having meditated upon the beginning of the creation having thus established the material foundations of the universe having thought it into existence then gradually awakens or rouses from its meditation and in doing so starts into manifestation the process of evolution on the material, mental, and spiritual planes, successfully and in order. Thus the upward movement begins and all begins to move spiritward. Matter becomes less gross. The units spring into being, combination being to form. Life appears and manifests in higher and higher forms and mind becomes more and more in evidence. The vibrations constantly become higher. In short, the entire process of evolution in all of its phases begins and proceeds according to the established laws of the indrawing process. All of this occupies aeons upon aeons of man's time, each aeon containing countless millions of years, but yet the illumined inform us that the entire creation, including involution and evolution of a universe, is but as the twinkle of an eye to the all at the end of countless cycles of aeons of time the all withdraws its attention its contemplation and meditation of the universe for the great work is finished and all is withdrawn into the all from which it emerged but mystery of mysteries the spirit of each soul is not annihilated but is indefinitely infinitively expanded the created and the creator emerged such is the report of the illumined you have to think about the process of each density and each density you start out at one then you got two and where we're at three, we're, we're already halfway on to four. We're like on the sub sub octave of four, we're like chickling. Um, in each one, your soul goes through different lessons and different things have to happen in order for you to evolve higher and higher and higher. And when you get through each of these cycles, which, you know, from the law of one and from other books, we're reading 75,000 year clips of what we perceive as time. And then there's major and minor cycles that we all go through as souls. And then we climb up after we graduate. Like right now, we're in the middle of graduating. Many of us, not all of us are. And again, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's a, it's a personal choice that you made before you incarnated here, whether you're going to stay or some of us are going to go. Um, I'm going. I hope so. I'm going up. But if you can imagine that there are other beings who have already did this dance and done it before and they're on the higher five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 and 11, then 12 and 13 and 14, all the way up into whatever it goes. And then they merge back with creator. But they still are, they're a whole now. They're not a fractal of creator anymore. They're a part of creator, but creator still has aspects of itself. And then it'll probably shoot out and the whole process starts again in another created universe. We can only speculate. But um, from everything that I've been reading, religious and non-religious, <coughs> it's a process. The above illustration of the meditation and sequence, awakening from meditation of the all, is of course, but an attempt of the teachers to describe the infinite process by a finite example. And yet as above, so below, 
The difference is merely in degree. And just as the all arouses itself from the meditation upon the universe, so does man in time cease from manifesting upon the material plane and withdraws himself more and more into the indwelling spirit, which is indeed the divine ego. There is one more matter of which we desire to speak in this lesson, and that comes very near to an invasion of the metaphysical field of speculation although our, our purpose is merely to show the fertility of such speculation, we allude to the question which inevitably comes to the mind of all thinkers who have ventured to seek the truth. The question is, why does the all create universes? The question may be asked in different forms, but the above is the gist of the inquiry. Man has striven hard to answer this question, but still there is no answer worthy of the name. Some have imagined the all had something to gain by it, but this is absurd. For what could the all gain that it did not already possess? Others have sought the answer in the idea that the all wished something to love. Others that it created for pleasure or amusement or because it was lonely or it manifested its power or plural explanations and ideas belonging to the childish period of thought. Others have sought to explain the mystery by assuming the all found itself compelled to create by reason of its own internal nature, its creative instinct. This idea in advance of the others but its weak point lies in the idea of the all being compelled by anything internal or external. If its internal nature or creative instinct compelled it to do anything, then the internal nature or creative instinct would be the absolute instead of the all. And so accordingly, that part of the proposition felt falls. And yet the all does create and manifest and seems to find some kind of satisfaction in doing so. And it is difficult to escape the conclusion that in some infinite degree, it must have what would correspond to an inner nature or creative instinct in man with corresponding infinite desire and will. It cannot act unless it willed to act and it would not will to act unless it desired to act. And it would not desire to act unless it obtained some satisfaction thereby. And all of these things would belong to an inner nature and might be postulated as existing according to the law of correspondence. But still we prefer to think of the all as acting entirely free from any influence, internal or well as external. That is the problem which lies at the root of difficulty and the difficulty that lies at the root of the problem. What a conundrum. Strictly speaking, there cannot be said to be any reason whatsoever for the all to act for a reason implies a cause. And the all is above cause and effect, except when it wills to become a cause, at which time the principle is set into motion. So you see the matter is unthinkable, just as the all is unknowable. Just as we say the all merely is, so we are compelled to say that the all acts because it acts. At the last, the all is all reason in itself all law in itself, all action in itself. And it may be said truthfully that the all is its own reason, its own law, its own act, or still further, that the all is reason, is act, is law, are one, all being names for the same thing. In the opinion of those who are giving you these present lessons, the answer is locked up in the inner self of the all, along with the secret of being. The law of correspondence in our opinion reaches only to the aspect of the all, which may be spoken as the aspect of becoming. Back of the aspect is the aspect of being, 
in which all laws are lost in law. All principles merge into principle and the all principle and being are identical, one and the same. I always say that we're all one and the same. Therefore, metaphysical speculation on this point is futile. We go into the matter here merely to show that we recognize the question and also the absurdity of the ordinary answers of metaphysics and theology. In conclusion, it may be of interest to our students to learn that while some of the ancient and modern hermetic teaching, teachers have rather inclined in the direction of applying the principle of correspondence to the question with the result of the inner nature conclusion, still the legends have it that Hermes the Great, when asked this question by his advanced students, answered them by pressing his lips tightly together and saying not a word, indicating that there was no answer. But then he may have intended to apply the axiom of the philosophy that the lips of wisdom are closed, except to the ears of understanding. Believing that even his advanced students did not possess the understanding which entitled them to the teaching, at any rate, if Hermes possessed the secret, he failed to impart it. And so far as the world is concerned, the lips of Hermes are closed regarding it. And where the great Hermes hesitated to speak, what mortal may dare to teach? But remember that whatever be the answer to this problem, if indeed there be an answer, the truth remains that while all is in the all, it is equally true that all the all is in all. The teaching on this point is emphatic. And we may add the concluding words of the quotations, to him who truly understands this truth hath come to great knowledge. I know it's very perplexing. But if you think of the all being the source and that we're playing out roles and on the theatrical stage of life and that we go and return back to it and it's all a part of it, it's the beginning. The planes of correspondence as above, so below. As below, as above. So below, as above. The Kabbalion. Very famous. The great second hermetic principle embodies the truth that there is harmony, agreement, and correspondence between the several planes of manifestations, life, and being. This truth is a truth because all that is included in the universe emanates from the same source and the same laws, principles, and characteristics apply to each unit or combination of units of activity as each manifestation, its own phenomena upon its own plane. That's why each density has its own laws and rules. If you think of it as a simulation. Third density is about self-discovery, understanding yourself, coming to understand that there's other selves as well. And the higher correspondence to that is understanding that each person has a fractal of you in them other selves, not just another fragmentation of your soul in another body that might look like you, but your other self, selves. Sorry guys, I gotta shift a bunch. My tummy is... My tummy's my tummy, my tummy's annoying. And yes, I'm wearing a dress. 
I am going to possibly do a meditation for July 5th. We'll see. For the purpose of convenience of thought and study, the hermetic, prince, the hermetic philosophy considers that universe may be divided into three great classes of phenomena known as the three great planes, namely the great physical plane, the great mental plane, and the great spiritual plane. These divisions are more or less artificial and arbitrary for the truth is that all of the three divisions are but ascending degrees of the great scale of life, the lowest point of which is undifferentiated matter and the highest point that of spirit. And moreover, the different planes shade into each other so that no hard and fast division may be made between the higher phenomena of the physical and the lower of the mental or between higher of the mental and the lower of the physical. And this is very much a big key that we need to start grasping a little bit harder and understanding that what is happening to us right now um, as we are transforming and ascending, we're taking our physical vehicle supposedly, okay? There's no proof, tangible evidence to, to say that this is actually gonna happen, but a lot, the majority of people are coming and subscribing to this principle. So, what is happening is the moving up in density, things do change. Colors are becoming more vibrant. We're vibrating and frequenting in a higher pace than we normally are. Um, a lot of us are going through a lot of purging of the old junk in our bodies. Uh, many of us who are of a higher density soul our bodies need to meet and match that vibration. So it's putting through some of us, like myself, through hell. But there is shades and scales of all of this. So it's not overly impacting us at once. It's slowly shifting things, bringing them in and shifting them higher if that makes any damn sense. But things in the fourth dimension density look the same as if they were in third, but they might be vibrating on a higher plane. So your matter material, physical reality might be brighter. Things might be lighter. Things might pop out at you more doesn't mean that it went through a dramatic change. It's slowly progressing up. In short, the three great planes may be regarded as three great groups of degrees of life manifestation. While the purpose of this little book do not allow us to enter into any extended discussion of or explanation of the subject of these different planes, Still, we think it is well to give a general description of the same at this point. At the beginning, we may well consider the question so often asked by the neophyte who desires to inform, be informed regarding the meaning of the word plane, which term has been very freely used and very poorly explained in many recent works upon the subject of occultism. The question is generally about as follows, is a plane a place having dimensions or is it merely a condition or a state? I swear these bugs. Yes, I have, I have a lot of bugs. We answer no, not a place nor ordinary dimension of, of space, and yet more than a state or condition. It may be considered as a state or condition, and yet the state or condition is a degree of dimension. 
and is scale subject to measurement. Somewhat paradoxical, isn't it not? But let us examine the matter. A dimension, you know, is a measure in a straight line relating to measure. The ordinary dimensions of space are length, breadth, and height, or perhaps length, breadth, and height, thickness, or circumference. But there is another dimension of created things or measure in a straight line known to occultists and to scientists as well, although the latter have not yet as applied to the term dimension to it. And this new dimension, which by the way, is the much speculated about fourth dimension. See? Is the standard use in determining the degrees or planes. The fourth dimension may be called the dimension of vibration. It is a fact well known to modern science as well as the hermeticists who have embodied the truth in their third hermetic principle that everything is in motion, everything vibrates, nothing is at rest. From the highest manifestation to the lowest, everything and all things vibrate not only do they vibrate at different rates of motion, but as in different directions and in a different manner. The degrees of rate of vibrations constitute the degrees of measurement on the scale of vibrations. In other words, the degrees of the fourth dimension. Why do you think it's taking us so long to get the fuck there? And these degrees form what occultists call planes. The higher the degree of rate of vibration, the higher the plane, and the higher the manifestation of life occupying that plane. So that while a plane is not a place, nor yet a state or condition, yet it possesses qualities common to both. We shall have if I can get the page turned. More to say regarding the subject of the scale of vibration in our next lesson, in which we shall consider the hermetic principle of vibration. You will kindly remember, however, the three great planes are not actual divisions of the phenomena of the universe, but merely arbitrary terms used by the hermeticists in order to aid in the thought and study of various degrees and forms of universal activity in life, the atom of matter, the unit of force, the mind of man, and the, be the being of the archangel are all but degrees in one scale and all fundamentally the same. The difference between solely a matter of degree and rate of vibration are all creations of the all and have their existence solely within the infinite mind of the all. The Hermeticists subdivide each of the three great planes into seven minor planes, and each of these latter are also subdivided into seven subplanes, all divisions being more or less arbitrary shading into each other and adopted merely for convenience of scientific study and thought. The great physical plane and its seven minor planes is the division of the phenomena of the universe, which includes all that relates to physics or material things, forces, and manifestations, and includes all forms of that which we call matter and forms that which we call energy and force. But you must remember that the hermetic philosophy does not recognize matter as a thing in itself or as having a separate existence even in the mind of the all. The teachings are the matter is but a form of energy that is energy at a low rate of vibration of a certain kind. And according the Hermeticists classify matter under the head of energy and give to it three of the seven minor planes of great physical plane. The seven minor physical planes are as follows. The plane of matter, A. The plane of matter, B. The plane of matter, C. The plane of ethereal substance.
the plane of energy A, the plane of energy B, the plane of energy C. The plane of matter A comprises the forms of matter in its forms of solids, liquids, and gases as generally recognized by the textbooks on physics. The plane of matter B comprises certain higher and more subtle forms of matter of the existence of which modern science is but now recognizing the phenomena of radiant matter in its phases of radium, et cetera, belonging to the lower subdivision of this minor plane. The plane of matter C comprises forms of most subtle and tenuous matter the existence of which is not suspected by ordinary scientists. The plane of ethereal substance comprises that which science speaks of as the ether, a substance of extreme tenuity and elasticity pervading all universal space and acting as a medium for the transmission of waves of energy such as light, hair, electricity, etc. This etherical substance forms a connecting link between matter, so-called, and energy partakes of the, of the nature of each. The hermetic teachings, however, instruct that this plane has seven subdivisions, all have of their minor planes, and that in the fact that there are seven others instead of but one. Next above the plane of ethereal substance comes the plane of energy A which comprises the ordinary forms of energy known to science, its sub seven subplanes being respectively heat, light, magnetism, electricity, attraction, including gravitation, cohesion, chemical affinity, et cetera. And several other forms of energy indicate by scientific experiments, but not as yet named or classified. The plane of energy B comprises seven subplanes of higher forms of energy not as yet discovered by science, but which have been called nature's finer focuses. Forces, sorry, you see that that's, it's coming back, damn dyslexia, and which are called into operation and manifestations of certain forms of mental phenomena and by which phenomena becomes possible the plane of energy C comprises seven subplanes of energy so highly organized that it bears many of the characteristics of life, but which is not recognized by the minds of men on the ordinary plane of development, being available for the use of beings of the spiritual plane alone. Such energy is unthinkable to ordinary men and may be considered almost as a divine power the beings employing the same are, are as gods compared even to the highest human types known to us. The great mental plane comprises those forms of living things known to us in the ordinary life, as well as certain other forms not so well known except to the occultists. The classification of the seven minor mental planes is more or less satisfactory and arbitrary unless accompanied by elaborate explanations that are foreign to the purpose of this particular work. But we may as well mention them. They are as follows. The plane of mineral mind, the plane of elemental mind, A, the plane of plant mind, the plane, the plane of elemental mind, B, the plane of animal mind, the plane of elemental mind, C, the plane of human mind. The plane of mineral mind comprises the states or conditions of the units of entities or groups and combinations of the same, which animate the forms known to us as minerals, chemicals. These entities must not be confounded with the molecules, atoms, and corpuscles themselves the later being merely the material bodies or forms of these entities, just as a man's body is but his material form and not himself. These entities may be called souls in one sense and are living beings of a low degree of development, life, and mind, just a little more than the units of living energy, which comprise the higher subdivisions of the highest physical plane. The average mind does not generally attribute the possession of mind, soul, or life 
to the mineral kingdom. But all occultists recognize the existence of the same and the modern science is rapidly moving forward to the point of view of the hermetic in this respect. The molecules, atoms, and corpuscles have their loves and hates, likes and dislikes, attractions and repulsions, affinities and non-affinities. And some of the more daring of modern science minds have expressed the opinion that desire and will, emotions and feelings in atoms differ only in degree from those of men. We have no time or space to argue this matter here. All occultists know it to be a fact and others are referred to some sort the more recent scientific works for outside corroboration. There are the usual seven subdivisions to this plane. The plane of elemental mind, A, comprises the state or condition and degree of mental and vital development of a class of entities unknown to the average man, but recognized to occultists. They are invisible to the ordinary senses of man, but nevertheless, exist and play their part of the drama of the universe. Their degree of intelligence is between that of the mineral and chemical entities on the one hand, on the one hand and of the entities of the plant kingdom on the other. There are seven subdivisions to this plane also. The plane of plant mind in its seven subdivisions comprises the state or conditions of the entities comprising the kingdoms of the plant world, the vital and mental phenomena of which is merely well understood by the average intellect, per, intellect, intelligent person, many new and interesting scientific works regarding mind and life in plants. Having been published during the last decade, plants have life, mind and souls, as well as the animals, man and Superman. Apart from this book, you can go back to looking at Dolores Cannon, who has specifically done regressions where people found themselves to be the elements, the fire, the rocks, the air, the wind, the mineral life, water, mountains. People were sitting as rocks for thousands of years until it became more self-aware. That it became a plant or tree standing there in the middle of wherever. Cognizant of everything going on around it. Understanding the harmony and the rhythm that goes on in the soil and in the earth and out above. So if you combine, if you are a Dolores Cannon fan, and you read her work and you start to understand that concept that at one point, many of us were the tree, the rock, the ground, that everything has an essence in itself. This will help you understand this concept. The plane of elemental mind B in its seven subdivisions comprise the states and conditions of a higher form of elemental or unseen entities playing their part in the general work of the universe, the mind and life of which form a part of the scale between the plane of plant mind and the plane of animal mind and entities partaking of the natural, of the nature of both. Sorry, guys, I have to get a drink. The plane of elemental mind B in its seven subdivisions comprises of the states and conditions of higher form of elemental or unseen entities playing their part in the general work of the universe. The mind and life of which form a part of the scale between the plane of plant mind and the plane of animal mind, the entities partaking of the nature of both. The plane of animal mind in its seven subdivisions comprises the state and conditions of the entities, beings, or souls animating the animal forms of life familiar to us all. It is not necessary to go into details regarding this kingdom or plane of life, for the animal world is familiar to us 
as our own plane. The plane of elemental mind C is in its seven subdivisions comprises those entities or beings invisible as are all such elemental forms which partake of the nature of both animal and human life in a degree and in certain combinations. The highest forms are semi-human in intelligence. The plane of human mind in its seven subdivisions comprises those manifestations of life and mentality which are common to man in his various grades, degrees, and divisions. In this connection, we wish to point out the fact that the average man of today occupies but the fourth subdivision of the plane of human mind, and only the most intelligent have crossed the borders of the fifth subdivision. It has taken the race millions of years to reach this stage, and it will take many more years for the race to move on to the sixth and seventh subdivisions and beyond. But remember that they have been races before us which have passed through these degrees and then on to higher planes. Our own race is the fifth, with stragglers from the fourth, which has set foot upon the path. And then there are a few advanced souls of our own race who have outstripped the mass masses and who have passed on the sixth and seventh subdivision and some few being still further on. The man of the sixth subdivision will be the superman. He of the seventh will be the overman. Now, just to like rewind a little bit, just to put this in perspective, when we start in third density, we think of Neanderthal caveman mentality. We're thinking of lower minded humans. We were dumbed down. And through the cycles of Earth and incarnation, you go through an experience. So, as a caveman, I, ouchie, put my hand in the fire. I was hairy. I went on fire. I died. I came back the next life realizing that that is a no big no no, even though I have the fail of forgetting. I still have that now inner gut instinct not to go near that fire and touch it. And as we do those things and we evolve consciously, we now see all the stages throughout our history that we can recollect and go back and behind to see where everybody was developmentally in a cognizant way through the ages. Though I must say we were dumbed down again after the enlightenment period. where I do agree with that to an extent that many people who were supposed to be awake and received the intelligence from the ether got it, but got killed for applying it and bringing it into existence because they don't want us to ascend the controllers of our planet. You can call it the controllers, the simulation, the AI. I don't give a shit what you call it. Again, it's all perspective, but it's all going back to this. It all still has to go back to these principles and to this understanding of what the planes are and the subdivisions of everything, because it's really the fundamental basics of how we evolve on a soul mental level so just think about like each cycle the seventy-five thousand years that we traverse as souls and that we come into different time spans and frames of time and each of those frames of time that we live our soul and our intellect has evolved
although technology has rapidly in the last 50 years increased by the 10th degree, there are still very much sleeping people that are not as cognizant to what is going on. And that's by design. In our consideration of the seven minor mental planes, we have merely referred to the three elementary planes in a general way. We do not wish to go into the subject in detail in this work, for it does not belong to this part of the general philosophy and teachings. But we may say this much, in order to give you a little clearer idea of relation of these planes, to the more familiar ones of elementary planes bear the same relation to the planes of mineral, plant, animal, and human mentality and life that the black keys on the piano do to the white keys. The white keys are sufficient to produce music, but there are certain scales, melodies, and harmonies in which the black keys play their part and in which their presence is necessary. There are also necessary as connecting links of soul condition entity states between the several other planes certain forms of development between being obtained they're in the last fact given to the reader who can read between the lines a new light upon the process of evolution and a new key to the secret door of the leaps of life between kingdom and kingdom the great kingdom of elementals are full recognized by all occultists and their esoteric writings are full of mention of them. The readers of Bull Wears, Zanoni and similar tales will recognize the entities inhabiting these planes of life. Passing on from greater mental plane to the greater spiritual plane, what shall we say? How can we explain these higher states of being, life and mind? to minds as yet unable to grasp and understand the higher subdivision of the plane of human mind. The task is impossible. We can speak only in the most general terms. How may light be described to a man born blind? How sugar to a man who has never tasted anything sweet? How harmony to one born deaf? All that we can say is the seventh minor planes of the greater spiritual plane, each minor plane having its seven subdivisions, comprise beings possessing life, mind, and form as far above that a man of, a, of today as the later is above the earthworm, mineral, or even certain forms of energy or matter. The life of these beings so far transcends ours that we cannot even think of the details of the same. Their minds so far transcend ours that to them we scarcely seem to think, and our mental process seem almost akin to the material process. The matter of which their forms are composed is of the highest planes of matter. Nigh, some are even or some even said to be clothed in pure energy. What may be said of such beings? On the seven minor planes of the great spiritual plane exist beings who may speak as angels, archangels, demigods. On the lower minor planes dwell those great souls who we call masters and adepts. Above them come the great hierarchies of the angelic hosts, unthinkable to man. And above those come those who may, without in irreverence, be called the gods. So high in the scale of being are they, they being intelligence and power being akin to those attributed by the races of men to their conceptions of deity. These beings are beyond even the highest flights of the human imagination and the word divine being the only one applicable to them. Many of these beings as well as angelic hosts take the greatest interest in the affairs of the universe and play an important part in its affairs. These unseen divinities and angelic helpers extend their influence freely and powerfully <clears throat> in the process of evolution and cosmic progress. 
Their occasional intervention and assistance in human affairs have led to the many legends, beliefs, religions, and traditions of the race, past and present. They have superimposed their knowledge and power upon the world again and again, all under the law of the all, of course. But yet even the highest of these advanced beings exist merely as creations of and in the mind of the all are subject to the cosmic process of universal laws. They are still mortal. We may call them gods if we like, but still they are but the elder brethren of the race, the advanced souls who have outstripped their brethren and who have foregone the ecstasy of absorption by the all in order to help the race on its upward journey along the path. But they belong to the universe and are subject to the conditions. They are mortal and their plane is below that of the absolute spirit. The Only the most advanced hermeticists are able to grasp the inner teachings regarding the state of existence and the powers manifested on the spiritual planes. The phenomena is so much higher than that of the mental planes that a confusion of ideas would surely result from an attempt to describe the same. Only those whose minds have been carefully trained along the lines of hermetic philosophy for years, yes, those who have brought with them from other incarnations the knowledge acquired previously, can comprehend just what it means by the teachings regarding the spiritual planes. And much of these inner teachings is held by the hermeticists as being too scared, being too sacred, important, and even dangerous for general public dissemination. The intelligent student may recognize what we mean by this when we state that the meaning of spirit as used by the hermeticists is akin to living power, animated force, inner essence, essence of life which meaning must not be confounded with that usually and commonly employed in connection with the term religious, ecclesiastical. I'm never going to get that out projected wise. I'm sorry, guys. Spiritual, ethereal, holy. To occultists, the word spirit is used in the sense of the animating principle, carrying with it the idea of power, living energy, mystic force, and occultists know that that which is known to them as spiritual power must be employed for evil, as well as good ends. In accordance with the principle of polarity, a fact which has been recognized by the majority of religions in their conceptions of Satan, Bezelbub, the devil, Lucifer, fallen angels, and so the knowledge regarding those planes have been kept in the holy of holies in all esoteric fraternities and occult orders in the secret chamber of the temple. But this may be here said that those who have obtained higher spiritual powers and have misused them have a terrible fate in store for them. And the swing of the pendulum of rhythm will inevitably swing them back to the furthest extreme of material existence, from which point they must retrace their steps spiritward along the weary rounds of the path, but always with the added torture of having always with them a lingering memory of the heights from which they fell owning to their evil actions. The legends of the fallen angels have a basic, I have a basis in actual facts, as all advanced occultists know. The striving for selfish power on spiritual planes inevitably results in the selfish and soul losing its spiritual balance and falling back as far as it had previously risen. But to even such a soul, the opportunity of return is given. And such souls make the return journey, paying the terrible penalty according to the in inveritable law. In conclusion, we, we would again remind you that according to the principle of correspondence, which embodies the truth as above, so below, as below, so above, all the seven hermetic principles are full operation on all of the many planes, 
physical, mental, and spiritual. The principle of mental substance, of course, applies to all the planes, for all are held in the minds of the all. The principle of correspondence manifests in all, for there is a correspondence, harmony, and agreement between the several planes. The principle of vibration manifests on all planes. In fact, the very differences that go to make the planes arise from vibration. As we have explained, the principle of polarity manifests on each plane, the extremes of the poles being apparently opposite and contradictory. The principle of rhythm manifests on each plane, the movement of the phenomena having its ebb and flow, rise and fall, incoming and outgoing. The principle of cause and effect manifests on each plane, every effect having its cause and every cause having its effect. The principle of gender manifests on each plane, the creative energy being always manifested and operating along the lines of its masculine and feminine aspects. As above, so below, as below, so above. The centuries old hermetic axiom embodies one of the greatest principles of universal phenomena. As we proceed with our consideration of the remaining principles, we will see even more clearly the truth of the universal nature of the great principle of correspondence. I'm going to leave it there. Not easy concepts. Um, I could have made really good notes. Um, but the way I've been feeling, that was much clearer. And with what's going on with me, much better. So I hope you got something out of that. It's difficult to grasp for some, but it's worth studying and it's worth looking at the law of one. It's worth also reading Dolores Cannon because they correspond with these principles and it gives you different examples of how you can apply what we just read to everyday life and past lives and spiritual stuff. Sending each and every one of you love and light. Please consider supporting my work. Again, I don't know when my internet will be shut off. I am trying to put it out in the ether that things work out for me somehow. I am trying very hard to manifest and not freak the hell out. Um, I am also cleaning out my house and trying to sell as much as I can before it goes to charity and the garbage can. Um, so there's a lot going on in my, my personal life and a lot that is being taken away from doing this work, but I'm gonna to attempt to keep doing videos when I can. And I hope you enjoy. And if you would like to help me move, please support my work. Please be safe. Have a happy 4th of July if you're in the United States. Be safe, be seen. And I'll see you hopefully on the next one. Bye, guys.